You're watching Mick and T's Sports Report on CHCO TV. And now, here's two guys who plan on watching the upcoming Super Bowl on tape delay, Evan and Joe. I'm Joe Tykotsky down in New Haven, Connecticut. I'm Evan McFarlane here in lockdown, New Brunswick, Canada. <laughs> and this is episode 32 of Mick and T's Sports Report. And uh, as Mark mentioned in our opening, we both plan on watching the upcoming Super Bowl on tape delay. What's up with I, that? I, I would like to say that I can pause it to do my, my reps of sit up some push ups in between, but it's actually just to go and refill my bullet chips. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, on our next episode, um, we've already gotten some Super Bowl predictions from people before the playoffs started. So we're hanging on to those. And then after. Uh, the Super Bowl's over. Next episode, we'll go over who did what. But uh, in lieu um, in lieu of our TV quiz segment, I will be giving Evan a short quiz to test his Super Bowl trivia knowledge. And that means it's time to pop up the Super Bowl logo, which is probably illegal that we're using it, but that's okay. Um, you ready for the quiz? No. <laughs> Okay, here it's it's true false. So you get a fifty percent shot. Okay. All right. um, for Super Bowl one back in nineteen sixty seven, the most expensive ticket was twelve dollars. Uh, uh, I'm gonna say true. You are correct. It is true. Twelve dollars, which is basically the cost of one hole of golf at the Algonquin, where you're the golf pro. Is that correct? True enough, and it's uh, also the price of half a beer at this year's Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Okay, second one. The first Super Bowl was televised by both Fox and CBS. No, I'm going to say that's false. I think only one company would have the rights to it. You're half and half. It is false, but Fox was not even around back then. But believe it or not, NBC and CBS both telecast the game which is odd um chco was beaten out in the bidding at the last minute for the <laughs> okay third one the halftime entertainment for the first super bowl was barbara streisand oh that's gotta be false that is false and <laughs> believe it or not for the first five super bowls there were college marching bands for the halftime entertainment what I love, I love college marching bands. They are yeah. probably one of my favorite things at university sport. <laughs> they got to bring them back. Um, and let's see. Uh, okay, here's one. From 1960 to 1969, the NFL played a consolation game for third place. That sounds so odd that I'm going to go ahead and say that it's probably true. <laughs> you are correct, and it is odd. They had the uh, teams that lost in the semis and then the conference finals played for third place, which is just an odd one. Uh, and then the last one, it's not really a question, but uh, purposes. <laughs> yeah, and the last one, it's not a question. Uh, it's just a little tidbit. Um, the New York Giants are 2-0 and in Super Bowls against the New England Patriots. Don't know oh. if you knew that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a Giants fan. That's all we got our hat to hang New on. The Giants had two plays in two games that won two <laughs> Super Bowls. So they didn't really win two Super Bowls. They just had two plays that were very lucky. <laughs> yeah. Um, excellent job on the quiz. Um, right, a couple other, yeah, we'll go to that. A couple other news things. A uh, reminder that when you're watching the Winter Olympics in February, to keep an eye out for Mark Nichols, who is a guest on our show. He is part of the Canadian team in the men's curling competition as he goes for a second gold medal. All right, let's go on to music spotlight and we'll see who you have first. Yeah, kind of. I stumbled across this band just cruising the, the ECMA website. They're called Hillsburn and they're an indie pop rock band from Nova Scotia. They got, they got some good hits. So you should check them out. Okay, Hillsburn. And this tune is called When We Were Young. I'm pretty sure I
Hillsburn and When We Were Young. And I will go with a group from Charlottetown PEI called Baby God. Um, and uh, they're from Charlottetown PEI in quite an array of uh, musical styles, all within a 45 second sample. This song is called Insane Now. Now it gets going. going at some point in this. sort of like a 70s California sound to it. All right. Um, that is it for the first part of the show. Coming up next is part two of our interview with Tom Liston as he gives us some details on what the Basketball World Heritage Center in nearby St. Stephen's will look like. You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. Welcome back to Mick and T's Sports Report on CHCO TV. On our last episode, Tom Liston gave us some amazing background information on the world's oldest existing basketball court, which will be the centerpiece of the Basketball World Heritage Center in nearby St. Stephen. In part two of our interview, Tom talks about how the facility will be a tourist draw for all of Charlotte County, and he also shares some pictures of what the building will look like. And now here's part two of our interview with Tom Liston. You recently made a, an amazing donation of $200,000 towards the project. What's the total that will be needed to get everything built and how far along are you in that fundraising process? Yeah. So when I came in, I think they were at, you know, 700 and some. So we were in spitting distance of the million that they originally wanted to target. And the million uh, from phase one, they would call it. Uh, is to buy the two buildings. So it actually, the court actually spans across two different buildings. They have a different facade on, on the front, but uh, to buy the two buildings and, and work with um, engineers to, to make sure the structures, you know, as, as we build out the structure around it and what have you, we're gonna expand, expand around those two buildings and make the experience center around it. But it's all the engineering work. It's, it's the marketing, it's the buying of the two buildings. It's getting some uh, some advice on how to preserve the floor and, and the ceilings and everything properly. Uh, and that'll be phase one, all that, all that work. And when, and we'll have an announcement in January, what that will, will, will tip the balance over, over a million. Uh, and then, uh, phase two will be almost nine to 10 million. And that will be all the heavy, you know, all the heavy lifting of, of the construction of the experience center, all the artifacts that are brought in, all the displays, interactive, you know, uh, 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 experiences that they'll they'll have so that that's the big heavy lift and that'll be a combination of you know working with provincial federal and private sector we'll need all three to come together because it's, it's a big number and 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 really uh, I, I didn't answer uh, Evan's other question but it's related to this you know part of the pitch is just how much community impact and what's great is we have d data from Ganong Chocolate Museum we have data from Kingsbury we have data from this tourism in the region and as you know, we're only five and a half hours from Boston <laughs> and we're and and as people come through, maybe they're going to PEI or what have you or Cape Breton, you know, we want them to spend an extra day or two in Charlotte County along the way. And this will be another draw to, to bring them through. So the economic impact looks fantastic. And, and it's more than just uh, you see this old court or yet you come to the Experience Center. You know, our view is you have the Garcelon Center 500 feet away. You have a new hotel being built you know, 500 feet from that, how do we have 
basketball tournaments and make it a hub, not just the experience center and the old court and the visits to that, but how do we make it a basketball hub in the region? Whether you stay at the gonk when 15 minutes away or you stay you know, nearby, maybe you have some games at the local gym here and then you kind of have the tournament that works up to the Garcelon Center. And we're already talking about how do we get a, a high-end court to the Garcelon Center uh, to kind of have the finals and have some university teams play down there. You know, the goal of maybe having a Raptors practice there one day all that in the cards and, and to make it a real tourism de destination for cool. basketball, not just about seeing the, the world's oldest court. Yeah. Yeah. Evan said that when our show gets bought out by HBO, we'll donate some of the first uh, royalty Fantastic. from Reed. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, we're going to pop up a couple pictures here just to give people an idea of, uh, of uh, what's going to be going on. This is, and uh, we don't have the highest tech, so I'll get out of the way, but there's sort of the, the street view of um, what the center will look like. This is the exhibit area, which looks very neat. Um, a lot of hands-on stuff and just historical factors. And then this is, it's like a sky bar that sort of overlooks everything. Yeah. Will that be a restaurant? They'll, they'll be, they'll, we'll probably have it, have catering come in rather than have a whole kitchen and the whole thing but you know we'll have kind of a wine bar or, you know and, and a couple taps on, on there and have there's a couple of neighboring um uh, uh restaurants right beside it there's there's two that could cater and that helps again the local community in terms of economic development what have you um but uh yeah we wanted to have a center that you could kind of rent out you could you know watch the raptors game there or or just have a you know private function or what have you so and then there's going to be a terrace that you saw in the first picture that overlooks the river. It's a beautiful view in that corner. Um, and the other thing from the first picture, you saw that there's two buildings connected, right? So the courts on that second floor, which is also quite interesting. And then the, the, the piece beside it will expand the space. And then of course have, you know, wheelchair access and everything else that you can kind of come back into the, the court. So that's the current vision. This, this is part of the presentation that they uh, yeah. first presented to me in August. And it's just really well done and really well thought out. Yeah. Okay, we'll get you out with this. We have this very cool old picture. The gentleman on the far right of the screen, um, or actually over my left shoulder, with the mustache is Lyman Archibald, the guy that came up to St. Stephen and who's from Nova Scotia. And then in the back, you can't see him fully, sort of with the gray wool jacket, is Dr. Naismith. Um, uh, so a very neat picture of the world's first uh, basketball team and the, the history as you know Tom the the game it's an amazing game and every sport has its history but certainly how this game started out and and what it's turned into it, it's just you could write books and books and movies and movies on it and not have enough time it's and it's fantastic to be invented by a Canadian and then have uh, you know a fellow from from Truro Nova Scotia Lyman and Archibald uh, be one of his first students. Not only was that the, the, the oldest basketball team or the first basketball team, but um, I believe most of them were actually his, his students as well. And, and where he taught the game, obviously taught them how to play, but more importantly, taught them to be evangelists of the game, right? Go back to your YMCAs and, 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 and teach locals the game. So Lyman, not long after that picture, would have went to St. Stephen, New Brunswick uh, and, and became, you know, the local director, whatever the title was, the local YMCA and brought the game to that court, put up the peach baskets, and, and a few months later played Callis Maine versus St. Stephen in a in one of the first games ever played. So does not only have the game invented by Canadian, but have the world's oldest court in Canada is just phenomenal and something we should we should be very proud of. Okay, we're gonna put some things up on the screen to find out more about what's going on here. They have a great website and it's called or it's the world's oldest basketball court.com so very easy to remember instead of googling it you just type in world's oldest basketball court.com we're also going to put up a link to a uh, a little feature that that i listened to on soundcloud about the whole project and the, the guy did a great job um explaining it uh tom thanks so much for sharing the stories your amazing project and what we know will be a first class tourist attraction for basketball lovers throughout Canada and the US. Oh, thank you very much. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention is, and, and it relates to where Evan's sitting right now, we're, we're, we're gonna have a charity uh, tournament in at the Gonquin in, in early August. And the initial response from, from a celebrity type tournament, right? Where a lot of folks will come in and 
And not only will they enjoy golf, but we'll take them to the to, to the to the world's oldest court, and we want them to start to evangelize and promote it as well. So we've already had some fantastic initial response from celebrities that just you know are excited about the court. You know, we sent it out on Twitter, and and whether it was Matt Devlin or Leo Routens or Michael Grange, everyone responded like, "Wow, this is amazing!" And they hadn't really known much about it. So we're going to try to bring them into town. Uh, play some golf, but more importantly, sort of get them to see the court and help uh, promote the the refurbishment and, and acceleration of the the basketball center. So it'll be a, quite a thing. He yeah, is I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be great, Tom. And I, I can speak on behalf of myself and Joe and the entire community, but you do so much work around here. And I know that St. Andrews is really proud to have you as a member of our community. So thank you very much for everything you do. I appreciate that. Best, best right. little town on the planet. I always say it. <laughs> He is Tom Liston, and he's on the board of directors for the Basketball World Heritage Center. Thanks so much to Tom for such a great interview. After this break, Small Town Spotlight heads to Quebec to talk all things maple syrup. You're watching Mick and T's Sports Report on CHCO-TV from, as Tom says, the best little town on the planet, St. Andrews, New Brunswick. It's time for another edition of Small Town Spotlight here on CHCO-TV. Since CHCO is available on Bell Satellite throughout Canada, you can watch our show on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights if you live in Legal, Alberta, Carrot River in Saskatchewan, or Cowhead in Newfoundland. And as always, you can watch the show on our YouTube channel. For our 24th edition of Small Town Spotlight, my mastery of French will be put to the test as we head to St. Lucie de Beauregard in the province of Quebec. With a population of 304, it's located two hours east of Quebec City and about six hours northwest of St. Andrews and is home to a family-run sugar shack and restaurant that makes some of the best maple syrup you've ever tasted. Let's welcome in Noemi Gatro Renier, owner of a restaurant and business called Le Bistro d'Herble. Noemi, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Okay, I was doing some research and I see a sugar shack is where the sap of the maple tree is boiled and made into syrup. Now you've owned the sugar shack there since 2005 in the restaurant since 2014. What months is your restaurant open? Because it's not year round. No, it's not year round for the moment. Maybe one day it will be, but uh, for, for the moment it's open in the maple season. So the maple season is during March and April. So those are the months where the people uh, really want to go to the sugar shack when uh, there's maple water and we make maple, maple syrup. So this is like the, the highlight <laughs> of the moment of the year. Now, during the other 10 months of the year, what other parts of your business are open? Well, actually, we have a forest farm. So uh, the farm is in the forest. So we cut woods uh, to do the firewoods uh, to uh, boil the maple syrup, for example. We also do firewoods for our own buildings and for other people. We have a sawmill also. The, so we transform this wood that we cut and we make maple syrup and make, uh, put them in bottles and cans and do maple products all year round also. Yeah, okay. Now visitors, uh, I see can have a meal in the restaurant and then take a tour. Give me some examples of the, the food that you'd serve during your meal. Well, actually we, ser we serve a traditional meal because uh, for the Quebecers, what is a, a sugar shack meal? It's always the same thing. It's always uh, crispy pork grinds and ham and beans and pea soup and meat pie it's always the same but we each have our specific like uh, i would say creno in french which is like a, a specific uh, like a specialty. type of food yeah specialty thank you <laughs> so uh, us our specialty is that we have uh, well first we're a small place there's only 50 places some sugar shag days there's 200 3500 places so 
us, it's like if you come to my own house uh, because there's only uh, 50 places. And there's yeah. the outside. There's the outside mm -hmm. of the restaurant. And um, exactly. OK, um, now, if people go on the tour, what will they see? Well, the tour is based on how we work. So how we do maple syrup. Uh, so we go around in the maple, in the sugar shack and we explain uh, the what we do with maple water, how we transform it and how we make maple syrup. Uh, that's uh, the tour. OK, now, where did you learn to make syrup? Well, actually, me, I come from Montreal, so it's not in my genes, <laughs> but uh, uh, my husband, Jérôme, uh, they had a second house here in saint lucie de beauregard and here in this place from Quebec, every family had used to have a sugar shack. So they learned it from their neighbors that they would go all the time every year, and then um, uh, we bought uh, this this uh, the sugar shack of these neighbors so then they showed us the how to make it because we had their their equipments so okay. that's how we learned and then we we have a club with uh, many producers so if we have a questions or a problem whatever we uh, it's like a community and uh, we help uh, each other's out also okay now is uh is that you in action yes it's me what are you doing there well i'm pouring maple syrup in the in the, the pot and this is probably to make a sugar uh, because uh, every product we have to boil maple syrup uh, at a higher degree to transform it so this uh, sugar uh, we have to bring it 44 degree fahrenheit higher than the, the maple syrup and then we have to um i don't know the word but the mix it yeah okay. until it okay. uh, granulates yeah okay now what's uh we could ignore that phone in the background don't worry about that <laughs> okay. um now how about i see kids this must be the one of their favorite parts of the tour what exactly are they eating they're, they're eating uh, maple toffee on snow which is uh, the big highlight of the meal uh, because uh, it's a it's an old way uh, we we have uh, boxes of snow uh, that we always put some clean snow and we pour it, the the maple toffee on the snow and af after a few seconds or minutes it's hard enough to roll it up uh, and then it's like that's what it looks like and it's pretty good okay yeah yeah now i read online that uh the province of quebec makes 73 percent of the world's maple syrup now what would you say is the the difference between syrup from your area and say a place like vermont well i would say that every place is uh has a different land so a different taste because the taste is related to the land and if it's near the water it has different taste than if it's in the uh, mountains for example so the terroir the land uh, gives a certain taste depending in where you are uh, this is so us we are in the mountains so we have a mountain syrup and it's pretty good because the land is thin so maybe it's concentrate uh, in there's more uh, vitamins of the trees i would say that is concentrated in the land because there's less land because it's on rocks um, and also in quebec what makes a difference in the maple syrup is what i was saying we are we are a community of producers and uh, so it's collectively that we put all the maple syrup and there's inspectors that always come to taste every barrel we sell uh, to make sure it's fine to sell it. So uh, it's like a pretty- um, Yeah, pretty rigorous, uh, yeah. Exactly. Now, is that like a desirable job to be the person that gets to taste the, the maple syrup? <laughs> I think it's a desirable job, but I also think that you have to be pretty good because uh, it impacts on the pay, uh, on the money that the producers get. So it's like, you know, uh, it's a hard job because uh, let's say a less good maple syrup is paid less than a super good maple syrup. So depending on your decisions, you have an impact on families' 
life sure, <laughs> on the no, pay. That is yeah. interesting. Um, we're going to put up your website at the bottom of the screen here. Um, and we see you have some of the products. You have maple jelly, maple yeah. taffy, chocolate pecan, maple crunch, and of course your organic maple syrup that we see right there in those neat uh, containers. And um, now th can those be shipped anywhere or just in Canada? Anywhere, yeah. I have a shipping today they have to send in the United States. Um, yeah, so we do some shipping uh, all through the world. Today it's uh, Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> Tennessee, wow, yeah. Yeah, Tennessee, Lennoxville. Uh not really the maple syrup capital of the United States, but uh, I'm sure that's uh, that that is that's pretty neat. Well, hopefully people will see our uh, the the listing of the website down there, and they can order um, uh, some of the products. Uh, and uh, Noemi, as I always tell all our guests, if you ever head to the United States and make it down New York way, stop over in Connecticut, and I will treat you to some of our world famous thin crust pizza. And maybe I'll even talk the owners of Sally's or Peppy's into making a maple syrup thin crust pizza. I've never mm. heard of that before, but you never know. You never know. Anything goes. You, <laughs> you can put right, well, maple syrup you. anywhere, even in the That's crust. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, she is Noemi Gatro Renier, owner of Le Bistro d'Herble in St. Lucie de Beauregard in Quebec. And Noemi, thanks so much for being on the show and giving us your time. My pleasure. And we are back. And I am in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. And uh, Joe is not in St. Stephen's, New Brunswick, which he may have mispronounced earlier. I just, I'll clear that out just before everybody comes at you with pitchforks, Joe. I added the S by mistake. Oh, man. That's, that's okay. So what about that, uh, that David Bowie t-shirt? Yeah, the David Bowie t-shirt. Well, the guest I interviewed lives in Quebec. And um, Evan, if you knew anything about music, you would know that David Bowie is from Quebec. There's, there's a place in England called Quebec. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> he is from England. I wish. I wish that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> Sacre bleu. Uh, <laughs> last time I trust Wikipedia for my uh, <laughs> free stuff here. All right, let's go with shout outs. Who do you have? To keep this one pretty basic but i think it needs to be said uh, i'm just going to give a shout out to all the local businesses that are going through this little lockdown that we have going in the brunswick right now uh, a lot of them are forced to shut down for a few weeks uh hang in there guys hopefully there's a uh, there's sunlight on the other side of this at some point but uh we'll see you all soon all right um I will take that from the sublime to the ridiculous. My shout out is to someone famous, Josh Allen, quarterback of the Buffalo Bills. In their playoff opener against New England, I took Buffalo giving five points and won me 20 bucks. Yeah, um, I wish they had given us 35 points. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All righty. Well, that is it for episode 32 of Mick and T Sports Report. I'm Joe in New Haven. I'm Evan here in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. Thanks to CHCO TV station manager Patrick Watt and editor Flo Rescent Mitchell. Oh, cool. uh, yeah. Patrick and Flo. <laughs> Patrick and Flo do an amazing job of producing and editing, editing a show that many Canadians will no doubt binge watch instead of watching the upcoming Super Bowl. Mm hmm. <laughs> And now that we've once again come to the end of another show, that means it's time for our closing catchphrase. So we'll keep the theme going and let's go with peace, love, and the New York Giants in 2023. <laughs> Not. Uh, this is Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO-TV, and we'll see you next time.